Okay, hear me out. I know HBO's adaptation of The Last of Us is not generally considered a barrel of laughs, but when I tune in every week, I can't help but think, this show is just so much fun. I promise I'm not a psychopath or a masochist or anything like that. And yes, I've already cried while watching this show and while playing both games. But I've also had a really good time with the series between the tiers, and that's okay. The Last of Us is a deeply moving piece of media. A once-in-a-generation sci-fi apocalypse epic in a generation inundated with a lot of sci-fi apocalypse epics, both on TV and in video games. I think the general consensus is that The Last of Us may not be the most original story, but its presentation is some of the best in the business. HBO, so far, is living up to that legacy. The show has incredibly detailed and realistic-looking sets, shown off by dexterous and sometimes playful camera work, and traversed around in by some incredibly believable actors. The sheer amount of money and talent that has been poured into this adaptation has resulted in an apocalyptic setting that is passably believable at worst, and fully immersive in its best moments. And, as horrible as an apocalypse would be to actually live in, they are endlessly entertaining to fantasize about outside of all the death and violence and whatnot. Do you remember about 10 years ago when The Walking Dead was still the number one show on television and an endless parade of zombie settings were flooding the video game market? It wasn't the most creative period for new and interesting stories, but it didn't really matter because zombie fiction doesn't have to be that well written or fleshed out. It just has to be easy for the audience to self-insert themselves into. What most of these zombie and zombie-adjacent stories have in common is their starting line. Each starts with the same idea. The world was like we all knew it to be, until suddenly, it wasn't. Because these stories start in something close to our reality, even the so-so ones really get the gears in my head turning, and I can't help but start to think, how would I fare in these situations? If the apocalypse started right this minute, where would I go, who would I take with me, and a really common one, what weapon would I use? Dude. No. There's a wall of them. A gun makes a lot of sense, but what kind? Probably not a cumbersome rifle that is hard to aim or move around with. Okay then, how about a pistol? It's light and easy to fire on the run. So far so good, but what about when you start running out of ammo? What's your creative, hypothetical solution to that problem? No, seriously, I want to know. What household item are you, the person watching this, turning into a makeshift weapon Dead Rising style as you race out the front door? This is a very video gamey question, and there are a ton of practical and silly answers to be found in the zombie genre and even in The Last of Us. Bill's traps in the show are very entertaining, both for the audience and the character. Oh. It doesn't get old. It's fun to see how he turns a Home Depot shopping spree into a town designed by the puppet from Saw. Plus, the show gets to keep things a bit mysterious by making the audience watch Bill set his most eccentric trap over 25 minutes of showtime before we actually get to see it in action. The Bill and Frank episode is a beautiful side story about trust and time and love persevering. But, it's also a chance to watch a deranged Nick Offerman live out some sort of weird apocalypse fantasy, and yes, it is fun. I'm not ashamed to admit that I still have these what-would-I-do conversations with my friends on a semi-regular basis, including while watching The Last of Us. The show does an excellent job of occasionally showing the audience survivors who are doing more than just killing each other. Bill designing his one-man town in Episode 3 is probably the best example, but there are a few others, like the old couple in Episode 6, who are kind of thriving in what is otherwise a terrible situation. Even though they barely have any screen time, this couple is really interesting to me because they seem to have stumbled across a solution to how to survive in this world that doesn't involve killing everyone they come across or living in some sort of terrible city-state. Their way of life is also reflected in the values upheld by the town of Jackson, 
and by Tommy, who questions if he and Joel had to actually commit the evils they did earlier in their life, which they thought to be necessary evils at the time. The scenes involving Bill, Frank, the town of Jackson, and the old couple, fleeting as they can be, provide an excellent break from all the blood, guts, and emotional trauma packed into the rest of the show. That might be why I latch onto these scenes so strongly. It's fun to see what hardworking and smart people can accomplish in a world that has essentially become a blank slate. It's also really fun to see how these new ways of doing things clash with perceptions about how the world used to be. All shared. Collective ownership. So, uh, communism. Nah, nah, it ain't like that. It is that, literally. This is the commune. We're communists. The world has ended. And that is sad. But that also means you don't have to go to work tomorrow or sit in traffic or pay taxes. It's easy to self-insert yourself into an apocalypse that begins in reality and transitions into fantasy. So what if you take that fantasy even further by following the 1% of people who actually managed to survive past the first few weeks? What if eventually those people start to not just survive, but thrive? In these stories, assuming you live long enough, the world can become your oyster. Some of these apocalyptic settings get a little silly with this idea, but the unspoken rule most of these shows and games follow is this. If you're crafty enough, you can build yourself a new world, or become some sort of model survivor. And everything is just sort of lying around for the taking without their former price tags. You know how much these are worth? Currently nothing. These stories show off time and time again that who you were before the apocalypse does not matter. Your old job doesn't matter. Your background, how much money you made, how successful you were. It's all meaningless when zombies or fungus rule the world. All that matters is how you choose to live in the new world you've been thrusted into. What'd you do before all this? Delivered pizzas? I think this is why apocalypse stories often choose to follow younger characters who, in addition to acting as stand-ins for the audience, often get to come into their own throughout the course of a story's run. Ellie and younger people in apocalypse stories get to experience a heightened coming of age. They can become more than they were before or discover potential they didn't know they had, even if doing so is sometimes a dramatic trial by fire. This is an exciting prospect for those characters and the audience watching them. The message that you can become more than what you were through extenuating circumstances feels like something positive, even though those circumstances are usually some god-awful global event. Ellie in The Last of Us is an interesting case. She has never known a time before the apocalypse, but she still is more sheltered than the rest of the cast because she grew up in a quarantine zone. For her, the journey across the wastelands of the US is also an adventure, and adventures, even dangerous ones, are exciting. I don't want to underemphasize how grim these stories usually are. They are grim. The worst of what humans are capable of is on full display in The Last of Us. But I don't think this series would have had the same longevity if it was all doom and gloom all the time. You need moments of levity, and hope, and humor. While a lot of people are praising how well The Last of Us handles its believable human drama, I think it would be doing the series a disservice to ignore these great, fleeting moments of life and love. And, of course, a few bad jokes. <laughs>